All right. Shalom, everybody. How are you doing? Uh, welcome to Efrat, Jewish community of Efrat, what I like to call uh, the Long Island of the West Bank. Uh, and uh, for, for a few reasons. First thing, it's actually shaped like Long Island. It's a long community, uh, long and thin. And also, it has a lot of Americans, about 40% of the folks that live in this town are Americans. Wow. And they are, this is considered the town with the most amount of doctors per capita in Israel. So that's, that's also kind of uh, Long Islandish. There's a lot of good folks that live in this town, a lot of professionals. This is really a professional's uh, town. And it uh, thinks of itself as a kind of uh, satellite community to Jerusalem. Right, it's about, how long did it take you? 25 minutes, 20 minutes? 20 minutes yeah. Okay, so in the morning there's more traffic, but basically it's right next to Jerusalem. Uh, for me, I, work, I actually work the opposite direction. I work in Hebron, so I live in this town, but I work 20 minutes that way. So it really finds itself to be right in between uh, Hebron, which is the capital of Judea, and Jerusalem, capital of Israel. And so it's like right in between these two places. And when I, like, uh, when I uh, like come into town, I don't know if you, you came in from what's called the northern entrance, very close by to here. So that entrance is a joint entrance to Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, and Ephrat. Now the Bible actually calls these two towns, their sister cities from the biblical perspective, which is Beit Lechem Ephrata. So it's really kind of cool. If anybody remembers their, uh, their Tanakh, their Bible, uh, Ephrat, Beit Lechem Ephrata, that's where the story of Ruth takes place. That's where King David is born. For the Christians, this is where Jesus is born. Okay, so we have the sister city, big... Uh, under the Palestinian authority of Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, and right afterwards, sharing the kind of exit is Ephrat. That's kind of cool. And then when I go down to Hebron, it, it like I come out of my uh, out of the southern entrance, and it says left to Hebron, Hebron, Beer Sheva, and to the right, Beit Lechem, Jerusalem. So if you're like a, a, a Bible-oriented person, these are the most beautiful names in the world, right? Hebron. That's like wow. That's the uh, where, where the forefathers and mothers are buried. That's where King David had his first kingdom. Jewish people have actually been living there without break for about 3,200 years. Uh, sometimes there's an ethnic majority, and at times, like today, an ethnic minority, but we've always been living in that town. So it's an honor for me to work there. And then, of course, Be'er Sheva. And then to the right, Beit Lechem, a very important Jewish city, today under the Palestinian Authority, and then Jerusalem. Uh, as you can see, this town... Uh, as you, did you walk down the staircases, you probably saw Beth, Beit Lechem or Bethlehem a little bit in the distance. And then you saw right here a lot of houses being built. So the people that live in this community, let's put it this way, they don't share the J Street outlook about, about living in these parts. They think to themselves, this is the most natural and organic thing to do, which is for Jewish people to live in this area. Like, this is where we've lived in the past. This is also, of course, Gush Etzion which was lost in the 1948 War of Independence. It was lost to Arab irregulars and Jordanian forces. And then it was re recouped, recaptured, liberated in 1967. I guess really one of the big points of contention is how do you see the Six-Day War? Do you see it as a war of occupation that we took somebody else's land? Or do you say, you know, Jews have been living in these parts. We had a first temple in these areas. We have a second temple. Right here in this, in this valley runs, the Maccabees created a water cistern uh, a system that runs all the way from Hebron. And in this valley right here, uh, it, it runs to bring water to Yerushalayim. So we had it here in, in the second uh, temple period, the second commonwealth period. You know, you say temple, it sounds like religion. That was just the heart of the story, but really it was a commonwealth. It was a civilization. You could be religious or not religious, but uh, you don't have to think of it as like a temple. When we say temple, oh, wow, that's like the religious folks. There was a commonwealth here uh, a, a, with, with its heart being this temple thing, but you don't have to buy into that. The fact is there was a Jewish presence here and really a state. Really, the truth of the matter is there was two Jewish states here in these very parts. And then when it comes to places like Hebron, Jews really never left. We're here, for example, uh, you know, all the travelers in the Middle Ages see the Jewish people living in these parts uh, they talk about it. Uh, in 1267, the Mamluks come and they uh, take over in Hebron, kick the Jews out of the tomb of the fathers and mothers. Uh, and we exist there for 700 years under the various Islamic rulerships from that time, the Mamluks, the, the, the Turks, the Brits, the Jordanians, and 
we come back, but we still always manage to live in these places. We just didn't have a sovereignty, but we always managed to live there. So now we're back. And so the people of this town, well, they don't share, as I was saying, they don't share the J Street outlook. They, share, they have a different outlook, which is there is nothing more beautiful, organic, and holistic than Jewish people living in these places. Yes, there's Arabs that live here. This town prides itself in having an excellent relationship with the nearby Arab communities and as much as we can with, with Beit Lechem, with Bethlehem. But so what? Okay, there's Arabs that live here. So what? Does that mean that there's an Arab sovereign here? No. There was a, there was a, there was a sovereign that took over here in 1948. Basically, in 1948, Israel declares independence, right? And we're attacked by six Arab armies. And, and did we win or lose the War of Independence? Well, we kind of won because we won independence, but we lost the actual heartland of the land of Israel. That heartland is where any Jew in the last thousands of years, you ask them, like, like you want to go to Israel? Yes. What's Israel? Oh, it's Ephrata. It's Bethlehem. It's Hebron. It's East Jerusalem. It's Bethlehem. It's Bethel, Beit El. It's, it's Shechem. Like, these are the places that anybody, any Jew from history would identify. He certainly would have never said the word Tel Aviv, which is a creation of the 20s. Okay, he never, we never heard of Tel Aviv because it never existed. He may have said Yafo. Okay, that's a place that has existed for a long time. Um, but this is the heartland. So in our mind, 1948, we lost, we won independence, lost the heartland. 1960, oh, 1948, Jordan occupies this land. Who is Jordan? Who is Jordan? Is it a legitimate entity? It's a British created entity. The people who rule there are not from there. They are Hashemites from Saudi Arabia that the British implanted there. It's really the last of the colonial made-up countries. It's a total colonial uh, holdover. And, and these Hashemites, trained by the British, armed by the British, led by the British, attacked Israel, took over a homeland. Nobody recognized it. In 1967, we came back and liberated that injustice. And so then we moved to the, and I brought you these nice little maps here. We have these fabulous maps that my friend Elon makes. I'm very proud of these maps. Uh, once you see this map, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it around, uh, basically this here, here's the New Jersey-sized state of Israel. Okay? It's very small. If you would, if you would match it up vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Arab lands in this region, 22 Arab countries, uh, we would be a matchbox on a football field. Okay, we'd be one matchbox on a football field. And then comes the, uh, the, the J Street ideology and says, let's divide that matchbox up and put the folks who have proven to be enemies of the Jews for the last hundred years on the highlands right above the half a matchbox. To us, it doesn't make any sense. Um, we think of ourselves as liberating this land and this New Jersey-sized state has a very natural border, which is right over there. It's called the... Jordan River, the Dead Sea Valley, and everything to the west of it is Israel, including these ancestral highlands. Uh, to me, I have a very hard time understanding how the two-state solution makes sense. What we're basically saying is, okay, this is your historic land. This is what the world, by the way, recognized in the 20s as being your land. It's the high ground. It's where everything that is Jewish identity is, is locked into, these cities that are part of our very identity, and they control the lowlands here and here. So, so it doesn't make any sense. We've tried it, and it has failed recurrently. And so to me, this two-state solution is really like, a, a, it, I don't even understand the internal logic of it, except for that there's a lot of Arabs here. Yes. Yes, there are a lot of Arabs. How many? Two million, three million, a lot. How many in Gaza? Two million. How many in Israel? Two million. Yes, there's a lot of Arabs. That's true. But, but how do I deal with those Arabs? Do I, therefore, because there's a lot of them, give them a sovereignty? Or do I say to myself, this is our land. Yes, there's a minority. How do I deal with them? I probably want to give them as many rights as possible without endangering the rest of the state of Israel. You know what? Because I'm a, a, little, a tad sick... I forgot to do my usual preambles, okay? I usually have uh, these preambles that I always do, which is so important. First preamble is, I'm not telling you the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you my truth. Okay, you don't have to buy it. This is my narrative. You can accept it, not accept it. This is the way we see things. And since I have an official capacity as a spokesman for Hebron, then I'm speaking to you in an official capacity as a person who represents a swath of thinking. 
You don't have to accept it. It's my narrative. That's number one. Uh, number two, Jewish and democratic. You won't hear that business from me. Okay? You won't hear me trying to sell you that Israel's is Jewish and democratic. Jewish and democratic. Because I can't believe that those two values would be co-equal. How could those values be exactly equal? Let's think about it. Jewish means an ethnic designation, a peoplehood designation. And democratic means not a peoplehood designation. And also Jewish comes from the word Yehudi or Yehuda, Judea, Judah. It's a Jewish word, obviously. And democracy comes from Greek. God bless them. Those two values cannot be co-equal. They, they can be respectful of one another, for example. A lot of times when people say, maybe in the J Street world, people say Jewish and democratic, what they mean is democratic first. That's the overriding principle. And Jewish because we're a majority, so we can stay Jewish. I don't think so. I think we're Jewish first, and democratic, a lovely principle, but certainly not a overwhelming principle, because the most important principle of the Jewish state is to be an ethnic national state defending our ethnic minority in this region. And here comes preamble number three. So preamble number one, this is my narrative. Preamble number two, Jewish and democratic, you won't hear that from me. That's just confusing business. We're a Jewish state first and only secondarily democratic. Uh, and thirdly, this is a very important point, which is about democracy, which is uh, how many Arabs are there in the Middle East? I think this is a baseline question. Does anybody, can anybody give me the answer of how many Arabs there are in the Middle East? Arabs, I don't mean Muslims now. I'm not counting Turks, Iranians, etc. I'm just asking Arabs, Arab Muslims, really. Sir? So you're North Africa, it's over 300 billion. Right, so almost 400 now, according to the CIA fact book and, and Wikipedia, etc. It's about 400 million, okay? So there's 400 million Arabs, and how many Jews, if you're so good with numbers, how many Jews are there in this Middle East? In the Middle East? Yeah. Around 7 million. Right, okay. Six and a half, and a half. Yeah, six and a half million here, basically in Israel, and basically nowhere else. A few thousands here and there in Iran and in, and in Turkey, but that's about it. So six and a half million Jews all concentrated in a small spot. For me, for my narrative, the way I understand it is that therefore Israel... Oh, how do other ethnic minorities fare in this region? How do they fare? Well, let's, let's talk about the Copts in Egypt. They're running away. They're Christians. By the way, they're the original Christians and really the original, the original Egyptians. Okay, how are they faring? Very poorly. They're on the run. They're getting blown up. How about Yazidis? How about Christians here in Bethlehem, etc.? Christians are generally, minorities in general, are on the run. Who, which kind of minorities make it here in the Middle East? Strong ones or armed ones. Let's give another example. Friends of the Jews, ironically. The Kurds. Kurds are a Muslim minority, but the jihad doesn't like them. For whatever reason. It's not our business why exactly, but they don't like them. But how do they make it? How do they have this uh, Kurdish independent area and, and other areas of the control? How do they do it? Because they're armed. They have an army. It's called the Peshmerga. They're about defending their ethnic minority in this region, even though they, so, they have the same religion. Okay, we Israel, in my opinion, the way I see the world, is that we're an ethnic national state defending our ethnic minority in this region. That is what we're meant to do. That is the resin debtor of, of the state of Israel, to defend our ethnic minority, not to create an Arab democracy. I don't think that anybody came out of the Holocaust and was like, damn, that was bad. I hope we can make it to the Middle East and create a democracy for the Arabs. I don't see that. I see that if there is democracy or rights for the Arabs, those are wonderful things incidental to the main impulse of the Jewish state. This is where I think some, sometimes American Jews get confused because we come from an American outlook, which is not an ethnic national state, it's a democracy, where equality and freedom are the main things. And I want to tell you something, those are beautiful values. I don't poo-poo those for a second. And I love New York and the multiculturalism of New York. I love Brooklyn to see to see every group of people sitting in one playground. I just drove past the playground in Brooklyn and I was like, this is so beautiful. There's something so amazing about just these various ethnicities getting along together so well. It's a beautiful thing. I, have, I don't poo-poo it. I don't poo-poo it for one second. But that is not what this region is about. This region is a tougher region. It's got a tougher outlook. And it has ethnic national states. By the way, the Arab states are all the ethnic national states with Islam as their, as, their, as their official religion, with Islamic calendar as their Islamic calendar, etc. And so we are amongst them. That's another thing that I disagree with from the J, J Street type of outlook, which is I don't think of us as some kind of Western implant in the Middle East. 
And I don't think of ourselves as being some kind of colonial white people in this region. I think of ourselves as actually ethnically Semitic people, and that our country has to play by certain rules that are actually like the Arabs around us. In some way, I actually think, that, ironically, that the J Street outlook is a colonialist outlook, while my outlook is much more regional. It's much more like the Arabs. I think of myself much more like the Arabs than this you know, liberal, give everybody democracy, blah, blah, blah. This is not the values of this region. It's not like this region at all. And, like, in an ironic, ironic fashion, it is the talk of liberalism, which is actually foreign to this area, and is, is a kind of implant, a kind of colonialism, trying to stoop into this area, something that is just not, it's not like this area. And, and I'm much more for being more like Arab states, more an ethnic national state that defends its ethnic rights in this region, and pushes back against bad guys. Who are bad guys? Are bad guys Arabs? No. No, they're not. There are many, many Arabs who think very differently. There are many Arabs who are victims from all kinds of forces. The enemy, in my mind, is the jihad, which is an ideology within the Arab world, within the Arab Muslim world, because there's also non-Arab jihad. There's also, by the way, not only religious jihad. There's secular jihad as well, like Arafat or... Uh, or uh, what's his name, Nasser, these are jihadists. They say the word jihad, but secular jihadists. Uh, just like, by the way, we have secular Zionism and religious Zionism, they, there's a lot of points of intersection. There's a lot of points of intersection between secular jihadism and religious jihadism. But in any case, the jihad is the enemy of, of, of Israel. It's also the enemy of other minorities, like the Kurds, for example. And the other enemy is the various supporters of the jihad, be they willing, Supporters or uh, useful, useful folks that maybe don't naï naively don't understand that they're actually supporting the jihadist uh, aspirations around here, which is to ethnically cleanse uh, Israel. By the way, let's let's just th for a second let's just talk about the PA just for a second. Let's start even with Jordan. When Jordan took over in 1948, this landmass. Guess what they did everywhere they went? They ethnically cleansed Jews from Hebron, from the old city of Jerusalem, 55 synagogues. They ethnically cleansed everywhere they went. They kicked out the Jews. Everywhere they either killed or ethnically cleansed the Jews. Let's talk about the PA. Everywhere that it goes. Hebron, 97% ethnically cleansed and we're not allowed to go into it. Shechem, a great city, a great historical Jerusalem, ethnically cleansed. Uh, and no-go zones all over Jerusalem, etc. The point is, is that the PA has in it, the PA has one modus operandi, which is ethnically cleansed Jews. That's a fact. There's only one city in all of the PA that Jews live inside, and that is the 3% of Hebron that the Jews live in, and then you guys are all upset about the fact that they're armed. Well, that's what the PA does, is ethnically cleanse Jews. So there's a little tiny island there that is armed and defending our ethnic minority rights in the city. So to me, look, folks, uh, I, I'm very excited. Um, this week is gonna be elections. And uh, I'm very excited for, for good elections. My hope, of course, is that the nationalist camp, the right-wing camp, whatever you want to call it, uh, will win the day. And I think that it will for really one simple reason. The two-state solution has failed recurrently. It has failed and failed and failed. The last failure, the last great failure, was Gaza. We walked out of Gaza, and people like myself went down there to protest, under democratic principles, by the way. Within, within, totally within uh, democratic uh, discourse. We went to protest. We said to our own beloved country, we said, Israel, our beloved country, don't make this mistake. You give away this land, it's just going to be a jihadist forward base within a year. But we were wrong. It took six months. Okay? And these guys now, we have now fought three wars uh, and countless uh, uh, rockets, just a thousand rockets last year, tunnels, uh, 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 balloons. Now, now imagine that here down in Hebron, right south of here, imagine that Israel pulled out and made a two-state solution and made this into a beautiful, peaceful Palestinian authority. Within, within a few weeks, it will be taken over by Hamas. Today, Hamas controls 80% of Hebron. They'll take over this area. And guess what? You'll have a Gaza right in the middle of... It's already almost there. Just, a, just give it a little, a little more push and they'll completely take over. And you'll have a Gaza sitting on this highland controlling the whole of Israel, Jerusalem will be under attack, etc. You could say to me, Yishai, you're over, your, 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 uh, you know, uh, your predictions are some kind of dark predictions. It's, it's a fact. It's happened everywhere, every time we've done it. And, and not only do I think so, but the, I think that the majority of Israelis now think so as well. 
Okay, I think Israelis after Gaza are really done with the two-state solution. <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu, maybe not your favorite guy, but just talked about sovereignty, already, already asserting sovereignty in Area C uh, here in Judea and Samaria. For example, this town. This, by the way, town has 12,000 people living in it, professional town right next to Jerusalem, as I told you. It's going to be annexed into Israel. And really, we hope that all of this landmass will be annexed. This will be Israel. And the question is, how do we deal with the Arabs within the land? Okay, that's the question to me. Not should I create a sovereignty for them, not is, there their land, is this their land, and certainly not the absurd usage of the word occupation, which has become such a, you know, everybody just chugs along the occupation train. Occupation, occupation, get, get out of here. We, we've lived in this place, we've, we're controlling this place, we're moving into this place, why? Do you think a person like me thinks to himself in the morning, ooh, I'm gonna occupy somebody else's land? Absurd. We're here because we think this is our land. That's what Isra many Israelis think, maybe the majority. And so, with time, we will annex. The question is only, how do we deal decently with the, Arabs that, um, the Arab minority that lives amongst us? I, too, am concerned about that. I'm just as concerned as you are. There's nothing that doesn't, just because I want control of this land does not mean, in fact, I think it actually means that I want to make sure that they have a decent life. What is the J Street proposal? To shrink our borders so that we could go back into the little Israel, and then we put these Arabs behind the fence, screw them, whatever happens, let them live under jihadism or oppression. Who's a more oppressive, Israel or the PA? Ask any Arab, don't answer that, ask any Arab, okay? And they'll tell you, these guys are corrupt, these guys are jihadist, we're going to assert sovereignty and they'll live in, in decency, we'll give them a life, we'll give them opportunity. Maybe not national rights, Here's, there's, there's gonna be the rub, That's, we're probably gonna discuss that, okay? But it makes much more sense. We're going to be an ethnic state. Yes, minorities. Give them decencies. Anybody's jihadist, he'll have to be fought uh, uh, one way or another. But this land is going to be our dominion, and they're going to live well if they so choose. That is the right-wing narrative, if you will. Okay? And I think that it's also the dominant narrative here in Israel, especially because of the recurring failures. That's where I think we're going to go, and we think it's going to be actually a very positive future. We're very, we're very hopeful for a good future. We're very hopeful for Arab-Jewish coexistence for those Arabs who choose to accept the fact that their cousins have returned home and have an ethnic state like theirs amongst them. And I want to tell you there are many Arabs, including Hebron, that are excited about that idea. For example, the whole Jabri clan, which is 35,000 people in Hebron, in Hebron, do not like the PA. They hate the PA. And they don't want Palestine. They realize that Israel is the sovereign, that Israel is going to give them a, a, an opportunity for a better life. And they've thrown off some of the jihadist ideology, which is that Jews should not be a sovereign entity in this area. So there are many Arabs like them. We look forward to coexistence with them. We look forward to giving them opportunities. But with a clear assertion that this is a Jewish state. It's really not that confusing. Next door are Arab states. God bless them. I want them to succeed. I want us to succeed amongst them. We're Semitic brothers. We have the same, almost the same gen uh, uh, genetics, almost the same language, almost the same religion. We're related. We want them to do well. But the way to do it is through recognizing that this is our land and to move forward from that. That is my presentation to you, friends. Okay. Yay. Okay, great. Now it's your opportunity to uh, ask questions and to duke it out. Yes, ma'am. Um, what implications do you think, you know, I saw also that BB said he was going to annex these areas. What implications do you think that has on the security of these areas? More Israel means more security. Like, do you think they're about... Well, let's put it this way. ...agreement on the other side? Okay, two things about that. First thing, more annexation means more Israeli presence means more security in my mind. But with regarding to the other side, the so-called other side, it's hard to know who the other side is because there's different factions. There's Hamas and Hebron. Is that the side you're talking about? There's the PA uh, on the brink of, 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 uh, of falling apart. Mahmoud Abbas, what is he in the uh, 13th year of his four-year term? And, uh, uh, you know, an old guy. Uh, how, many, how many? I think he has $100 million in the bank right now, which is nothing compared to Yasser Arafat, who had billions in the bank uh, when he died. So a corrupt old regime, people hate it in the streets. Uh, what do I think the security implications will be? I think that if you're waiting for Arab buy-in, like Arabs to be like, yay Israel, great Jewish state, so cool. I'm not expecting that. 
And I'm not, and I never, one second, and I never, and I never thought to expect that. I think that that idea is itself a, a bit naive. naive. It's naive. It's just not the way it works around here. We're not going to get them to buy into the thing. They're not like here in the synagogue studying, you know, early Zionism and Rav Cook over here. They're not doing that. They got their own thing, and, and I respect that. And I also respect that the way that they will appreciate us is through our strength, our presence here, which Jabotinsky called the Iron Wall. But I also think, and you'd be surprised, that there's an Islamic side to all this. I just met with a fabulous uh, imam from, from Iran who lives in Australia today. Uh, his name is Imam Tawidi. Uh, follow him. He's amazing on Twitter. He's the best Twitterer there is. He's amazing. And Imam Tawidi, you know, we sat down and we talked about what the Catholics came to in 1964, which is really a dual covenant doctrine, which means that Catholicism is, of course, God's chosen people in religion, but they have a separate covenant with the Jews, and that works well with the Bible. And so too with Islam. Islam, you're the God's, you're Allah's chosen favorite people, but there's four verses in the Quran which say that the Jews are going to come back to the land of Israel, and, and the Jews are chosen people, an important people, and that's the designation of the Quran, accept that, accept the will of Allah, okay? And, and helping them come to a religious outlook that, that deals with the re, helps them deal with the reality of a Jewish state in the midst of their Muslim Arab world. Yes? Um, so you spoke about in a debate how you are like opposite about this idea of this with like the Arab minority. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what that looks like, like more specifically? Yes. Citizenship and opportunities, and how you would envision Arabs buying into that. Okay, I talked about Arab buy-in a minute ago. My outlook isn't Arab buy-in. My, my my outlook is more Arab acceptance of the fact. With regarding to how Arabs, how Arab life would look like, it would look a lot like it used to look like before the peace process, which is the following. Let's 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 leave off for a second the question of of voting. Okay. We'll talk about that, but let's leave it off for a second because I don't want to get stuck in the mire of that right now. Here's what it would look like. Let's do the minimum. Minimum would be Arabs would be residents in Israel. There wouldn't be any, any, any checkpoints. There wouldn't be checkpoints. They would be, this country would be one country, no checkpoints, no borders, no walls. They would travel freely, work wherever they want to work, have opportunities, civil rights of free association, freedom of speech, etc. Go to the best universities in the Middle East, get the best medicine in the Middle East, shopping, there's better shopping in, in Qatar, I think, but Abu Dhabi, but, but, you know, whatever they want to do, they'll have that opportunity, but they will have to be loyal to the Jewish state of Israel. That does not mean that they have to be Jews. That means that they, have to, they can be Arab, Muslim, Palestinians, but not jihadists. They have to accept a credo upon themselves, which is, and, and we have a very simple example for that. If you want to know what I'm talking about, about the Arabs, it's really easy. It's called the Druze. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Druze, a, a loyal, non-Jewish minority living in our country, serving in our army at the top positions, in the Knesset, etc., etc., but simply accepting the fact that we're the boss, we're the sovereign, we're the Balapai in Hebrew, right? We're, we, we're the controllers of this land. And they are a loyal minority living amongst us. That, to me, is the simple outlook here. Okay? But you have to root out the people who are non-loyal slash jihadist. They can't, they, can't, they can't, unless they calm down, we, can, we can't have them you know, trying to undermine us. There can't be no-go zones in Jerusalem. You know what? You cannot walk into Isawiyah. You cannot walk into Isawiyah. If I look like this and walk around there, you can't do it. You can't do it. That will have to go as well. So I'll give them opportunities, but they got to also accept the fact that we're the sovereign here. That's just... If, if you want to understand what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the Druze. That's it. Yeah. So you had talked about um, the Jewish state and its connection to democracy. I was wondering about, in terms of as in the West Bank, um, what kind of rights Arabs are just like. Okay. So your, your question is now the voting question, which is a very, very fair question, I think. I'll give you a few different models, okay? I'm not going to give you one model, which is the... Because we don't know it. But I'll give you a few different thoughts of the directions that we're thinking about. One is actually, in some ways, it's really the simplest model of them all, which is, I don't know if you know this, but in 1988, Jordan 
which was controlling here until 1967, everybody, all the Arabs here still had Jordanian passports and Jordanian citizenship. That was pulled unilaterally from them in 1988. They woke up one morning stateless. That was wrong and illegal. What we say is give them their citizenship back in Jordan without them moving. Nobody's talking about them moving. They stay here as residents of Israel with a Bill of Rights citizen residency, yet they vote in the real Palestinian state, which is Jordan. Jordan is a Palestinian state, 70% Palestinian today. The king married a Palestinian girl. Yes, she's good looking, but it's also because she's Palestinian, okay? You know, and he wanted to make, make, make basically a Hashemite Palestinian monarchy over there. Okay, so there's a Palestinian state. They get, their, they get to vote in Amman, but they get to live here in Judea and Samaria. We provide everything, roads, education, everything that you have to do for resident aliens, residents of, of this land. Uh, that's one option. Another option is, yes? In that, do they pay taxes to Israel and they don't have a say in what their taxes go to? Yeah, there's, there's two ways of saying that. One is, yes, they pay taxes to Israel. But when you say no say, I'll give you an example. Closer to home, where are you from? Uh, New Hampshire. New Hampshire, okay. So uh, in the United States, there's a territory called Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is two million, two million people. Now, interesting how, how it works. You know, they do choose representatives to Congress. You know that? But the congressmen and women that they choose are non-voting congressmen. So they sit on committees. They have a right to even chair committees. They, have to, they could say whatever they want to say, but they're non-voting uh, 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 committee members. That's in America, one of the greatest democracies in the world. Moreover, they cannot vote for the president of the United States. Huh? People should, and you should be upset about that. That's fine. But before anybody critiques Israel, now here's the difference between, between Palestinians and Puerto Ricans. Puerto Ricans are not in any way dangerous. There's no propaganda in Puerto Rico to take over and destroy the United States of America. Within the Palestinian Authority, there certainly is. So, so if, 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 if the great democracy of America has many other territories, Samoa, U.S. Virgin Islands, etc., has an alternative framework for other peoples that really pose no danger for them, certainly Israel could come up with an alternative framework. So another way of thinking about that is... is um, Res so, that, so that's the Jordan option, okay? Fine. Another option is residence. We will annex, give residency to non-jihadist folks with a pathway to citizenship for pe people who prove loyalty, okay? Okay, that is basically what actually we have with East Jerusalem Arabs. They have that option. Most of them don't take it because they're ideologically against the state of Israel, which is a problem. Uh, so then another option is residency with a pathway to citizenship. Now this liberal folks have an easier time swallowing sometimes because that's basically what you have in most countries. When you migrate to a country, you have to swear allegiance to that country, including the United States. Yet another option is less, less uh, palatable to liberal-minded folks, which is residency, and that's it. You're a resident of the state of Israel. You want self-determination, you want the vote, Go, go somewhere else. Oh, but in that residency, you will control your local big cities. Hebron, nobody wants to get in your kishkas and, and tell you how to rule uh, Hebron. Rule Hebron your way, with your laws. But you are resident of the state of Israel. And if you start to coalesce some kind of jihadist movement, we'll fight you. We won't tolerate that. But you'll have your own life, your own self-rule, your own governance if you will, I don't call it autonomy or anything like that. I don't, I, I don't appreciate those, that terminology. But self-rule in, in their big cities and be residents of the state of Israel with maybe, again, non-voting representatives in Knesset. Again, what's, what's my goal? Get back to the meta, the meta goal. What is the meta goal? I want to control my land. I want to give minorities, decencies, rights, upward mobility, as long as it doesn't endanger the Jewish state, which is a minority in this region. So that's my thinking. So I'm thinking to myself, how do I give them as many rights as I can without them overrunning me via jihad, via voting, et cetera? Or certainly via the, the dumbest thing of them all, which would be a state of Palestine in my heartland. So those three things I want to push away, and I want to give them, find as many formulas as I can to think about how to give them decencies and rights. Certainly a much better way of thinking than you will find in the Arab countries right next door. Yes, sir. First, can you tell us a little bit about just kind of the story of the destruction of Kfar Etzion in that area in 97, um, just to give a sense of like what it may have felt like, I assume you weren't here in 67 and the years after, but what it may have felt like for the Gush Amunim movement and for Israel, even the secular people, 
And the other question is, why does your vision, the vision of the community that you represent, limit itself to the Jordan River when Jews lived east of, on the East Bank uh, in what is today Jordan, and before the Holocaust, before seeing the, the destruction uh, of the world Jewish community, and six million Jews in particular, uh, Jabotinsky and others believed that they could rule democratically, the Jews could rule democratically on both banks of the Jordan. Uh, so why, why, why allow that pragmatic concern to get in the way of an idea of keeping all of Jewish, historically Jewish land whole? Let me deal with the second question first, which is uh, a good question. And, and the truth is, uh, we have a claim on, on land across the Jordan, which was really historically ours, and also recognized before the British cut it off as, as, as the Palestine Mandate as, as really being Jewish and Israeli. But sadly, a, a different reality took place. It's, it's very similar to kind of Gaza. It's like, when you, when you make either mistakes or historical things happen that limit you. For, I'm talking right now about a certain pragmatism for our time. One day will we control Jordan to the river? Who knows? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe, 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 maybe Arabs will want us to have a big Jewish state that runs nicely and they'll live amongst Who knows? But that's really not the issue right now. There are certain practical things that we have to make happen today. And even in biblical times, those lands... Uh, 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 on, on the east bank of the Jordan River were oftentimes lost and those were the, the tribes, the Tunev tribes that were first exiled because it's, it's, really, it's really a kind of separated landmass. Okay? This landmass, it just makes perfect rational sense. I could show this to any congressman or any person and be like, look, this is a natural demarcation and from here. By the way, one thing I'm not going to get into with right now, but a much tougher question for a person like me is the Sinai. The Sinai, I am much more hawkish on the Sinai. I think the Sinai was the mother of all sins to give away the Sinai to Egypt. I don't believe in the peace with Egypt. I don't think it, it really resulted in any results. And I think geographically speaking, it, it never historically belonged to Egypt. That's a complete British, another British, you know, uh, just creation, figment of their imagination. Look at this line here in the negative. It's an absurd line. It's, it's a totally, there's no, there's no demarcated, it's not a real line there. And really, the Sinai, you know, should be under Israeli control. And of course, it would help us choke the, the problem that we have in Gaza and would help us control Migration would help us control sea lanes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But be that as it may, Jordan today is uh, a separate entity, and it would answer the Palestinian problem very, very adroitly. It would be like, you want a two-state solution? Here's the land that was ours. We cut it in half. Really, 77% went to Jordan. Take it, Ahlan Usahlan, and that's your, and that's your Palestine, okay? Uh, th that does not mean, by the way, that I give up my historical connection to this place. And there are tours today that you could take in Jordan talking about the history of these places. Moreover, really, we never really settled these places in the modern era. It just never really happened. It never really happened. There's no, there's no Kfar Etzion here. So, for a certain pragmatism, and we are still pragmatic. If you listen to my arguments against a two-state solution, they're not, I didn't say, God gave us this land, and the Torah says that we're not allowed to give it away, which I believe is true, P.S. But I also think that pragmatically, and I think that most Israelis understand that it doesn't make sense to create a Palestine in our heartland. That's just silly. Really, really, you know, I sit on an airplane, and a Gentile, a Goy, will, will, will lean over to me, and we'll talking, and he'll say, why do you try to give your land away to your enemies? I never have an answer to that simple question. I call that the question of the Gentile. When they're asking me this like, simple, plain old question, why would I create a Palestine in my ancestral homeland? That's just dumb. Okay, so, so that's with regard to that. With regard to your first question, a longer historical question, I don't know if, if we have the space for it, and I think it might bore people, but the bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that it's even more flagrant in Hebron, but in early Zionism, already in the late 1800s, Late 1800s, we populate these places. We populate Jerusalem. We populate these village places around here, and 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 uh, and in 1948, you know, mobs destroyed these beautiful communities here, and Israelis all felt that this was part of normative Israel. And uh, when these places were lost, everybody pined away to get back to these places. Okay, and so to us, again, I really I, I want to just truncate it and say. There's, to us, there's nothing more organic 
and holistic, normal than living in these places. This is the place of our, the roots of our identity, where we have lived, and where we want to continue to live. And as you can see, by the way, with your own eyes, and I show this to my Muslim friends all the time, shuf, shuf with your own eyes, look with your own eyes, and look, it's happening. And, uh, and as I like to say to them, Allah is with us, okay? Uh, we're building this place, and they see it with their own eyes, and you can either benefit from it, or continue your 100-year war of destruction, which has yielded Israel still doing well. And the Arab civilization is not. And I tell them it's min Allah. I tell them this is a return to you. You're, you, you, you're, you gotta, I tell them a lot of times, I say to them, snap out of your hate doctrines. Snap out of it, because it's just destroying you. We're okay. But look at your own civilization. Look, when I was a kid, Egypt and Syria were real countries. They're not anymore. They're, 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 they, are, they are just broken inside. They have no economic matrix, no tourism. Egypt used to be a touristic capital. Now nobody goes there anymore. Why? Because, because it's scary, because it's dangerous. Because their own, they've, they've allowed this hate to destroy them. Look, I, forget me, look at the cops. You're blowing up your own ancient Egyptians? Well, that sucks. And, and, and nobody wants to visit you because they'll, they'll rather go to, 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 you know, to Orlando than go visit the pyramids of Giza because it's dangerous. So your hate attitude has done nothing good. And I dare say that some of my colleagues on the liberal end are empowering the jihad, I'm getting to you in a second, by empowering the jihad, by allowing them to believe that yes, through war or through diplomacy, they will gain a foothold in this land. When I speak to congressmen, I just say to them, congressmen, I say, congressmen, you're fighting Iran in South Yemen. You're fighting Iran here in North Lebanon. Do you really want to put Iran right here? Do you really want to do that? This is just, again, just dumb. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, so the first one, uh, in this life, I'm assuming it's like an ideal world where there's um, peace between the Jews and the Arabs, but um, in this one ideal world of the one-state solution where Palestinians that are loyal or proven to be loyal become citizens, and like the Druze serve in the military, what do you have as a response for those who like, um, especially as you talked about from a religious perspective of like, uh, the, you know, uh, relatedness of, uh, of Jews and, and um, Arabs, um, about them feeling like they're fighting their brothers um, in war if they were to serve in this military. So what would be your response to someone who wants a one-state solution, wants to be a citizen? Um, is it that we like don't give any of them the right to serve, or they have to prove that they'd be okay to go against an Arab who they may feel like a brother or not? And um, Or is this like an ideal scenario where like there's peace now in the Arab world because um, we have made peace with the Palestinians in treating them fairly as much as we could with keeping the Jewish state. And then also my second question is uh, your comment about the Sinai um, uh, in that territory should have been kept as Israel. How do you feel about like the fact that that means Israel would also then be responsible for those people? And Responsible for what? For the 10,000 Bedouins that live there? How they're li living if you're, if you're I was there when we left the Sinai, and I remember how the Bedouins begged us not to leave the Sinai begged us. They said, don't leave the Sinai. Do not put us... The Bedouins and the Egyptians hate one another. Just so you know this. They absolutely hate one another. Really, that, you have to just know that. That's the kind of thing that you wouldn't know from you know, the social studies book. But I'm telling you, they absolutely detest one another. And they begged us. And that, now, who are these, what were these Bedouins doing? The Bedouins were all working for Hevral Aganata Teva, for the nature reserve. They were all like, their expertise was truly appreciated. Their knowledge of the land, all that kind of stuff. And they felt tremendously liberated from the Egyptian yoke. They hate the Egyptians. And would we take responsibility for the, I don't know, 10, 20, 000, how many, I really, that's a good question, I, I should know that. And I'm gonna check that, how many Bedouins exist in the, uh, in the Sinai Peninsula? It's, it's, it's not a huge number, you know what I mean? It's a, I don't know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw out a guess that it's a topmost 40,000, but if anybody wants to look it up for me, I'd appreciate it. Uh, in any case, uh, so yeah, we would, and in general, we want to take responsibility for people. And this is another weird phrase that you hear a lot of times in Israel. We don't uh, want to rule over another people. I'm like, uh, why not? All powers rule over other peoples. All powers rule over other peoples. There's nothing wrong with it. As long as you rule uh, with, with, with decency and, and morality. But yeah, we rule over other peoples. That's because we're a regional power. Just like Iran rules over 50 different kinds of peoples in Iran. 
it's, it's, it's just the norm of any large state or power to rule over minorities. So, so I want, and I want my minorities to live decently. I am not here to suppress my minorities. I'm also not the, here to, you know, make Arab culture flourish and to, you know, this is a Jewish state. I'm not, I'm not here to, by the way, I want you to know parenthetically, I am absolutely for Arabic being a second mandatory language in Israel. Oh, yeah. I've always believed that. It has nothing to do with, I absolutely believe that even in the nationality law, Arabic should be a second language in this country and that every kid should learn Arabic. Okay, that's a big question. Wait, 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 I just want to, that was end parentheses on that. By the way, why should we learn Arabic? Why, why should we learn Arabic? Why should we learn Arabic, guys? Yeah, because we live in an Arab region. Even in the biggest Jabotinsky dream in the world, we're still going to live in an Arab region. And it's absolutely imperative to understand the Arab mindset and the, and the Arab language. And, and, and by the way, learning Arabic also helps you understand Hebrew. It's part, it's, it's, it's an it's a enrichment of this region, and the American outlook of knowing one language is, is, is to me very, you know, provincial, and much better to be able to speak two, three languages. I, I speak three languages, and, and I spoke Arabic when I was a kid. T today, I sadly don't, and I want to work on that, but I certainly hope that my children will, will, will st I'm going to push them towards studying Arabic for sure. What was your first question? Well, I'm saying like... Oh, Arab armies, a Arabs serving the army. Uh, the truth is, first thing, I absolutely believe in Arabs serving in the army. It's, it's not even a question to me. It's so simple. But in general, I believe that uh, nobody should be overly coerced to serve in the military. What I believe in today is actually, this is a larger Israel issue, but I believe in, in, in enlarging, is that a word? Uh, 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 growing the uh, civil, what's it called? Uh, you know, huh? national, service. national service, thank you. The, the national service of the country. I believe that everybody in the country, if you're a uh, nonviolent, uh, what do you call those guys that don't want to, uh, pacifists, pacifists, if you're a uh, Tel Aviv hippie, if you're a Haredi, if you're an Arab, everybody's got to serve two years. If you don't want to serve in the army, no problem, go teach Yiddish at uh, this school, or go teach Arabic in this school, or go work at the zoo or the library, I don't care. But you have to serve the country for two years and have equality across the board. Anybody who has the protections of the state of Israel should have that. That's my opinion. Uh, colleagues of mine think differently. Uh, uh, with regard to Arabs shooting Arabs, hey, you know what I mean? If you want to be, if you have loyalty to the Jewish state, you want to fight the jihad, and they're threatening your way of life. They want to take your kids and, and turn them into jihadists. They want to take your money and pocket it. So, so I don't think it's, it's that tricky. Moreover, the last thing is, you should know this, it's very important, we're, the region is being redefined now. The whole Sunni thing of Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, etc., all these countries around us, they're changing their discourse vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. Why? Because they're all afraid of Iran. And Israel is now becoming the defense umbrella, the local NATO of these countries, and they basically want to get along with us because they want us to be the big boy in the block to push back on, on, on Sunni and Shiite Islam. Now, I just want you to know something. When the Shiite Imam, the, 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 the Ayatollah regime, when they wake up in the morning, what do you think that they want to do more than anything else? Destroy Israel? That's like a far second. For them, the big one is controlling Mecca and Medina. Okay? In their heart, they're like, ooh, this is so frustrating that the, that the Sunnah control Mecca and Medina. It's very frustrating for them. So they want to hold it. And, and, the, and the Saudis, they know that. And they understand that, that Iran wants to destroy them. They would wipe them off the map. Really, they would. So, so they're looking to Israel to control them. So I don't think that an Israeli army with Arabs serving in it would be anything more than proud Arabs uh, who defend uh, a state that gives them decencies, opportunities, rights, and upward mobility. And if there are Arabs that have a problem with that, then go work at the zoo or at the library. And if you really have a problem with that because you hold ideology that a Jewish state should not exist, well, we're going we're gonna to have a problem. Okay. Okay, these two guys, go. Um, I was wondering if in this plan it's important that there be a Jewish majority or if it's not important because um, non-Jews, I guess, would not have the right to vote. And if it is important, how would that be like, ensured? Fabulous question. Thank you. Your question is, is a Jewish majority 
a priority, a minimum, a huh? necessity. A necessity. Thank you for 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 this project to go along. And the answer is twofold. On the one hand, the question is absolutely right in the sense that no, it's not a b basic requirement. This is a Jewish state by definition. If we have a lot of minorities here, it doesn't interest me. We'll still control this land and still control those minorities. So that's that's the technical answer to your question. The other answer is, yeah, you know, let's, uh, it would be much better if there was a Jewish majority around here for various reasons, including cultural. Uh, and so I'd like to ensure that. How do we ensure that? That's a tricky, that's a tricky situation. Uh, some, people, uh, some people want to see assisted voluntary emigration for Arabs to help them leave to Arab land. Some people talk like that. Other people say that our birth rate is actually outbirthing them today, or at least as, as at parity. And then there's various, various considerations. The bottom line is, no, we don't need it for, for, for the Jewish state to be a Jewish state. And yes, it would be preferable to have a Jewish majority here. And it would be, it would be the right thing because at the end, when there's, a, when there's a majority and you're ruling a majority, it's not pleasant. It's definitely not pleasant. It's doable. There are many countries that have a minority ruling a majority. But we don't really want that. Okay? And, and Yasser Arafat you know, once said that the war for Palestine is in the bedroom. And that, and that will outbirth them. You know, uh, Palestinian mothers were having like seven, eight kids. Today they're down to three. And that's because of education. The, the, number, one, uh, uh, the number one family planning measure in the world is women's education. The, the minute you put women into workforce, just the, 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 the birth rates drop tremendously. And so, um, you know, other people say, don't worry, we're at parity with them and they're not going to on the other hand there is even at the on the right wingers way of counting things there is there's six million arabs west of the jordan river so that's a lot so i agree with you that there's there's an issue there and i agree with you there's an issue they're now also being you know there's discussion of you know palestine being palestine in saudi arabia or in jordan whatever it is and somehow migrating them out but i the answer is that's a, that's a, that's a, that's really a tricky question but even on the right, there's not a lot of people who are dealing with that solution. One thing for sure, before, before the problem gets a grip of us, is like one thing is for sure is not to give them, therefore, a chunk of sovereignty in our heartland. That is not the way to move forward on that problem. I think. I submit. Sir. So I feel like in America, um, sometimes you know, like college campuses, there's, um, there's, a, there's like a narrative from JVP and other groups like this that if there was a, a second state created, um, the, the Jews living in Judea and Samaria would be like the settler and they would get like citizenship or whatever. What do you feel as a Jew living in Judea and Samaria would happen to Jews if there was a second state? Okay, you know, that, that question I think is answered scientifically. Every time there has been anything like a Palestinian state, if it's 1948 Jordan, as I said before, ethnically cleansed us here in Gush Etzion, in Jerusalem, etc., a, a Palestinian authority, ethnically cleanses us from Gaza, ethnically cleanses us from Shechem, uh, no-go zones in Jerusalem. We know how it works. So no matter how many beautiful... We, we've actually lived under Islamic rule since the year 637 in various ways with a 200-year break uh, with the Crusaders, which was also not the most pleasant time. But the bottom line is we know perfectly well what it is to live as second-class citizens in, in their states. We were evicted from their, their states and ethnically cleansed from their states when Israel was announced. We know what it's like to live under their thing. Moreover, we also know that a Palestinian state is a warlike machine to try to ethnically cleanse the rest of Israel. That's what it has been every time. So the answer is, we're not going that way. That's not the direction that we're going in. We're really, we're really done with that. We've tried it. It's failed. Okay, it was a semi... I don't think it was a, ever a beautiful vision. I think a much more beautiful vision is the vision of one Jewish state strong amongst strong and successful Arab states, and we rise up together. You know, that to me is a beautiful vision. I don't think that, that cutting our matchbox in half and empowering the Palestinian Authority on these heights, which is the ancestral Jewish homeland, makes any sense. And so we're not going in that direction. And all this, those, um, you know, uh, lip service that we will be residents or, or, or citizens in, in a Palestine, I think it's, you know, hogwash and has been disproven. I think, I think uh, Eve called it... Yeah, um, so we um, need to start eating lunch to make sure that we're out on time. Each day. If you're available to answer more questions on one, one that's great. If not, it's okay. fine. Um, but just let us know if we have to leave this. Okay, so let me just fin let me s yeah. summarize and say that I really I want to thank Eve for organizing this. 
and I want to thank you guys for coming out here. I, I never expect anybody to necessarily agree with me or to accept what I'm saying, but I do expect that we have a good conversation. These conversations are important, and I think that having seeing the other narrative that exists today is important. So I really, I really believe in this dialogue. I make time for this dialogue because of that. And I also honor your intellectual integrity for being on this kind of trip and trying to see different sides. So I want to honor you and thank you. And let us hope that indeed uh, we're going to move forward towards a, a more peaceful, more uh, harmonious resolution towards the future. And don't forget, I want to finish off with this. We think that we're living in great times. In our mind, this is the greatest time in Jewish history in 2,000 years, the rebirth of the Jewish commonwealth, the, the rebirth of Hebrew, the, the economy, the army, the farming, the Zionism. We think it's a beautiful time, and we think that this time will uh, broadcast beauty and harmony to our neighbors as well. So thank you very much.